trust. So we all believe that trust is really central to the widespread adoption of AI. Rachel Botsman, a fellow of the University of Oxford, defines trust as the confident relationship with the unknown. But people are quite concerned about the unknown, they're concerned about the future, as this survey shows. So they worry about things like fake news and job loss and automation of jobs, and those are areas where AI has been used and even misused. The good news is that people seem to trust scientists, and we must preserve this trust in science as we are starting to use AI in the way that we evaluate and disseminate research advances. And we need this knowledge in order to empower society to tackle some of our most pressing global challenges. So I'm very delighted uh, to speak to you today about how we're disrupting an industry that is actually quite traditional, uh, surprisingly so, given scientists are at the forefront of their field, um, but they're very conservative in the way that they are communicating their research advances. So I already have an introduction. Um, so Frontiers uh, is, was a startup from the EPFL 15 years ago, um, and uh, we are really on a mission to make science open. So there's a real purpose to it. And open can have different meanings, and I'll come to this type of definition of open throughout my talk. To put us in the publishing landscape, we are now the sixth largest publisher, but size has to go hand in hand with quality. So reputation, particularly in this industry, is absolutely everything. We can measure quality in publishing by citations, to our articles that we publish, and Frontiers is now the third most cited publisher. We were born digital um, and also open access, and we have made the founding decision at this, right from the start to build our own publishing platform, to have this open science publishing platform that we can develop, improve, and customize as we are serving the uh, researcher community. And we believe that this is uh, one of the reasons for the success of our quality at scale. We now have 150 journals operating on this platform. Um, we receive over 20,000 submissions a month, and we work with external experts that use our platform to evaluate research um, and make publishing decisions, so reject or accept decisions on the submissions that we receive. And that is really at the heart of this quality assurance is making that right decision. With the size, with our growth and our size, now we have to obviously invest in our teams. They have grown um, globally to over 1,600 um, frontons, we call ourselves. Oh, there is something missing there. Um, basically, um, we have a, a, a large department of technology experts, software developers, testers. Um, that is the column in the middle, uh, which is over 500 people now. Over the last two years, we got quite good at looking at curves, I think, all of us. So the good news is that these are not COVID cases, but they are COVID-related submissions, daily submissions we started receiving uh, at the beginning of 2020. And you can see how scientists started uh, really springing into action, and we were flooded with these types of manuscripts that uh, put our teams, our processes, our technology to the test, because we wanted to evaluate them very quickly, but even more thoroughly. And at the same time, the experts that we needed to evaluate these manuscripts were working on the front line. COVID is a great example of the power of open science. When the pandemic hit, the White House, together with leading research groups, um, brought together a database of 400,000 full-text, freely accessible articles on uh, COVID and coronavirus-related research. And they made this database available. Um, big uh, business also got involved, uh, and it was in a format that allowed uh, NLP applications and other AI techniques to really uh, gain new insights. And that spurred um, innovation, you, which you can see in, when you look at the database of the WHO uh, vaccine development, how much uh, really was achieved in a very short period of time, just because uh, we made a lot of data available um, very easily. 
we are on this exponential. We have more active researchers, they produce more data, and they publish more. And we don't want to limit uh, this, uh, this information getting out there, but we want to quality control it. And it is this, this, uh, f uh, this, uh, this knowledge that is feeding this innovation cycle, this virtual cycle where you get more economic development, growth, that feeds back funding into more R&D from government and industry. And this would be great news if there wasn't a little problem about how we are communicating science. And that is a lot of the research advances are still published in subscription journals. That means they're locked behind paywalls, so they're not easily accessible. So we, with COVID, we, we reacted uh, to an urgent health crisis by making or by mandating even uh, this, uh, these research advances to be uh, open and accessible, but we have other crises, other challenges that we need to respond to, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, and climate change. And here, still only about 20 to 30 percent of the research articles are freely available. We got quite used to very rapid technological advances in our lifetime, in my lifetime. Hopefully, you recognize some of the left images. And then you come to scientific publishing. So between these two images lies 357 years. That is not a lot of change, it seems. But I'm actually quite optimistic, because AI really has the power to accelerate uh, in this area. Publishing suit is quite suited to AI. Uh, we moved from print to digital. Um, we also now attach quite good metadata to articles. We have more of it. It becomes more structured uh, and more available. So that is good news. AI also has a lot of strengths that work really well in publishing. So we can use things like pattern recognition, content classification, um, and uh, decision support in uh, the way we do peer review. So that is excellent news. The data that we have in publishing is very rich. Uh, it's extremely connected. We know an awful lot about our users. Uh, we know um, who the authors are, who they co-author with, who they cite, where they work, um, and, and what they work on. So it's extremely well connected. But it needs to be open to work best. And it needs to be in a machine-readable format. And this is still not universally so. And that is something that uh, we are working towards. And that will really uh, drive a lot of the innovation that we're going to see in the future. Because we need to get this right. So what I was talking about, bringing AI and open data together, will allow us to operate um, better quality assurance at scale to respond to this increase in articles that we see. Because if, if things go wrong, so here are examples of articles that had to be retracted for various research integrity issues, such as plagiarism or um, image manipulation. This is when we erode trust in science, when we get these things wrong, things slip through the system. AI is a central strategy for us at Frontiers. Uh, we developed an AI module uh, that is operating on our platform. Uh, called Ira. Uh, she stands for Artificial Intelligence Review Assistant. We, so she's a she. Uh, we use her in two different areas. Uh, one is on quality checks, the other one is on expert recommender systems. And that is really about putting uh, researchers and content uh, together. She sits on top of a knowledge graph uh, that is fed with all this data that I talked about, this, this very rich data that we have access to. We do curate the data, we bring it in from different sources to uh, improve the data, um, because we know that the better the data is, the better the outcome of these machine learning algorithms that operate uh, on the knowledge graph. Let me show you a couple of examples uh, of what uh, IRA looks like in action uh, on our quality checks. Each of our submissions will go through um, a number of quality checks, um, quite a few of them at the submission stage and during peer review. Currently, Ira helps with 13 of those checks. She will flag issues that she detects um, to the team and will also hold um, the workflows that are running in order to ensure that a flag is resolved before the manuscript can move through the peer review. Everything relies on human validation, um, so the AI is not allowed to make any uh, decisions. 
image manipulation um, is my first example. So this is really when um, data gets falsified. Uh, it is a big issue because it really pollutes uh, the scientific literature. And it's actually often quite hard to detect by naked eye. Um, because images can be rotated, they can be stretched, they can be slightly altered. So the AI will scan uh, images that are being uploaded uh, as part of the manuscript, and she will find uh, patterns that she highlights um, in a manner that is actually quite easy for the team then to go in and, within the context of the manuscript, make a final decision about whether there is a concern or whether it's a legitimate um, uh, duplication, for example. And then, of course, the, the team member, they have to um, either override her or they have to have all this, uh, the flag, and they will go into the system to give her feedback, and that is uh, transparently recorded um, in the system all the time. Another, uh, another example is face detection. So here, uh, that is quite relevant for clinical research. Um, you're quite familiar with this uh, in, in Facebook, uh, tagging your friends' photos. Um, so the, the um, AI learns to detect humans also amongst images of, of living beings and uh, will flag the manuscript to the team. They will go into the system, pick up the flag, look at the image, and then determine that the patient has been sufficiently anonymized and patient consent has been recorded in the manuscript. So the goal of leveraging AI in, in publishing is really around um, achieving this quality at scale, augmenting um, our decisions, make the teams uh, more effective and efficient, giving back time to researchers that act as reviewers and editors for us. And it was mentioned uh, also uh, at the beginning of, of this today was that we need to bring some of these success stories about applications in AI to uh, the public. Um, this is using media outlets uh, here to, to um, news items on IRA to really um, build trust in how we use AI to quality assure the scientific literature. Because once it's out there, uh, it gets read uh, and downloaded massively. So these are just uh, Frontiers articles. And everyone with an internet connection can basically access uh, these articles. And it's actually quite astonishing um, the, the, the usage of this type of literature. I mean, you just look at India. I mean, it's just, it is, the scale of it is actually quite impressive. If it's accessible, it doesn't mean that you can understand it. So, so going back to this idea, OK, something is open, you can access it, but that doesn't mean you can understand it. So we have a journal for kids uh, that aims at around 12 to 15 year olds, where researchers uh, rewrite their articles. AI is not yet involved here, but you can see that um, making this more understandable for an average adult scientific literacy level of a 15 year old um, that's usually sort of where we aim for, um, will really make the science more accessible also from a, from a comprehension point of view. AI can also do research in a way of uh, looking at a big corpus of literature, drawing higher level insights and correlations that are hard for humans to do. Uh, here an example, again, from COVID, based on the CORD-19 database, uh, that was a machine-generated view on the blood glucose levels in the severity of um, COVID in patients. And uh, when you look at lay summaries I mentioned, that is an area that is being actively developed on. Also for scientists, um, being able to keep up with all this literature is very important um, to, um, to, to get that fed in a, a more manageable manner. So think of your Blinkist um, or, the, or think of your um, Spotify playlist, so giving you reading suggestions. And those are, there are many companies out there that are working um, on these types of uh, services. So just to summarize, so artificial intelligence uh, is transforming how we disseminate uh, research advances. Uh, we are getting um, much better data now. It's, it's becoming more accessible. We can use that data with AI to um, have quality assurance at scale, so keeping up with this exponential increase uh, in knowledge production. Um, augmenting the humans uh, and, and really enhancing the way we uh, evaluate, um, disseminate, and also consume uh, research. 
And that is all there to build trust uh, in the scientific literature um, that allows the, the public to be informed, for policymakers to make evidence-based decisions, um, and also for our children uh, and their future. And with that, um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I hope there's some questions.